I was asked to give a, uh, well, overview kind of introduction to quantum field theory and curved space time, particularly algebraic approach uh, uh, to the subject and uh, so on. So let me go ahead and uh, proceed with that. So, well, as I would think most people in the audience uh, are already aware, but I might as well start at the beginning. I mean, uh, what is quantum field theory and curved space time? Well, it's a theory where the matter, everything except gravity, that is, is treated fully in accord with the principles of quantum field theory, but gravity is treated classically in accord, though, with general relativity. I mean, this thereby avoids uh, the issues of how to quantize gravity. Now, you could perturbatively, I mean, you could look at linearized, a linearized gravitational field off some background uh, uh, classical solution and treat it within quantum field theory and curved space time. But otherwise, I mean, although one could do that, uh, I'll just be considering the theory of a, of a uh, well, in the examples I'll do, I'll just consider the theory of a scalar field, but it could be any non-metric uh, field. And of course, uh, you know, it is not then an exact theory of nature, but it ought to be a good approximation when quantum effects of gravity, uh, uh, you know, are not playing a dominant role as, as it might right near a singularity, et cetera. Uh, but say outside a black hole, uh, including on the horizon and a little inside the black hole, there's no reason why the quantum effects of gravity itself should be dominant. And indeed by analyzing, uh, well, in particular black holes, I think quantum field theory and curved space time has certainly provided us with some of the uh, deepest insights we have into the nature of quantum gravity. Uh, it also, I think, has given us a lot of insights into the nature of quantum field theory because there's there are crutches that are used in standard discussions that involve the use of global Poincaré invariance, uh, you know, thereby allowing one to define global notions of energy. You get a unique Poincaré invariant vacuum state, or at least you can assume that you have one and so on and build a lot of the machinery of quantum field theory around that. You don't have that as I'll be describing in curved space time and that forces you into a purely local characterization of the quantum field theory and in terms of the field properties, not some constructs like particles and so on. So I'll, I'll be explaining that, but I think that is another very important insight that quantum field theory and curved space time is given. So just to you know, introduce, well, the way quantum field theory is usually presented and uh, then what happens in curved space time. Let me start with the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator that all of you are undoubtedly very familiar with. And I probably don't have to go through these equations one by one, but you introduce these this lowering and its adjoint is the raising operator as it's called. And in terms of these operators uh, that you introduce for the harmonic oscillator, the Heisenberg position operator is given by this formula in terms of the lowering operator and raising operator. Notice the positive frequency in front of the uh, lowering operator and the negative frequency in front of the raising operator. So this is just standard quantum mechanics. Uh, the ground state in this harmonic oscillator is determined by the, is the unique state 
that gets annihilated by the lowering operator. And you can obtain all other states or you know, a dense set of states in the Hilbert space by applying the raising operator, the adjoint of that to this ground state. Okay, so that's a review from, you know, would be an undergraduate quantum mechanics courses as well. Now let's move on to field theory. This, what I just said is very relevant uh, because, well, if we consider, I'm gonna consider a Klein-Gordon field as, you know, just the main model, but similar statements would apply for all of all other fields. Uh, uh, let me, to avoid any technical awkwardness, put our field in some, you know, box, very large box. I can let L go to infinity later, but just to avoid any awkwardness, uh, let me do that. I can then expand phi in Fourier modes of this box. And the Hamiltonian for the system then can be immediately seen to be just an infinite sum, the you know, integer type K, the discrete Ks are just the Fourier modes of this box of side L, the Hamiltonian that for the system, I guess I didn't write the Hamiltonian down here that would be associated with this wave equation, but the Hamiltonian then is just what I wrote down uh, over here in the harmonic oscillator, except now we have an infinite sum of them. So a free Klein-Gordon field is just an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators, and we can apply the same quantization type procedures as we did there. And I can immediately write down the formula for, or a formula for the uh, Heisenberg operator describing this, representing this uh, quantum field phi in terms of, well, these lowering operators are now called annihilation operators and the creation operators. Again, I have positive frequencies in front of the annihilation operators, negative frequencies in front of the creation operators. And this defines uh, this quantum field, of course, in flat space time, right? I'm in uh, Minkowski space time now for that, I should have emphasized that. Now there's one uh, caveat on this. If you try to make sense of this formula as defining some sort of operator at a sharp time and position, uh, that doesn't make sense. Uh, this sum just doesn't converge in any meaningful way. But if you smear as it's called the quantum field, uh, you just try to define the quantum, the average of the quantum field with some arbitrary test function f, average over a space time region weighted by some arbitrary test function uh, f. This thing is completely well defined. And uh, well, that gives you, in a natural way, a quantum theory of the Klein Gordon field. Now, the states are just in this construction uh, are just, you know, the same thing as we had for a harmonic oscillator, although the single harmonic oscillator, except now we have an infinite number of them. But if I look at the joint ground state of all of these oscillators in quantum field theory, that's referred to as the vacuum state. Here again, we're in, I emphasize we're in flat space time. If I apply N creation operators to this vacuum state, that has the interpretation of a state where a total of N particles, as they're called, 
uh, are present. So these excited states of the harmonic oscillator are referred to as particle excitations of, well, the ground state is now called the vacuum state. Um, this, no, I, I've been discussing a free field, but if we have an interacting field, the state may behave uh, like the state of a free field at early and late times. And again, then you can characterize the states in terms of at early times ingoing particles and at late times outgoing particles. And the S matrix uh, then, which relates those two descriptions of the states, has a lot of the interesting dynamical interaction uh, information about the interacting uh, uh, theory. So this particle interpretation is, you know, has been remarkably successful to the extent that you might get the impression, and you certainly would be encouraged to get the impression reading most quantum field theory texts, that quantum field theory is really a theory of particles, and these asymptotic particle states are all really the what counts, and you should only be talking about particles. But that's very much not the case. So when we get to curved space time, we won't be able to do that. Before I get to curved space time, uh, I want to emphasize that the notion or the presence of a time translation symmetry was very uh, uh, you know, important in all this. Well, I used a spatial translation symmetry to break this into Fourier modes. That's not as important. I don't really need to have any spatial symmetries to do this sort of thing. But I do need very much need a time translation symmetry to define these annihilation and creation operators and to define what I mean by this ground state. So that's a comment I want to make right away. For later reference, because this will come up again, you can compute the two-point correlation function of this quantum field, the expected value of phi of x, phi of y in this vacuum state. And I just want to point out that this behaves like one over the square of geodesic distance. Well, it's got to be, to define this as a distribution, appropriately, you've got to put in these various uh, epsilons. Uh, well, as this will come up, but in in a if we were solving if we were dealing with a curved space time wave equation, this form would get modified by logarithmic a logarithmic term and so on. But the basic structure is one over geodesic uh, distance squared. And then it's also worth pointing out that you know just like the uh, ground state of the harmonic oscillator is a Gaussian function of x, the ground state here of all the oscillators uh, is Gaussian in the sense that all of the higher endpoint functions, which are like moments of the distribution, the probability distribution, are given in terms of the second moment, the two-point uh, function by an analog of the formula you'd have for a Gaussian probability distribution. OK, well, if we now move on to a curved space time, so I'm only going to consider globally hyperbolic curved space times that have a well-defined you know classical dynamics for the field i mean they don't have you know time-like singularities or other things where you'd need extra boundary conditions or other conditions even classically to say what you're doing um in 
the case of stationary space times, you can do, well, you can't do it the same way, uh, you know, can't put it in a box or whatever the way I was doing it necessarily, but you, in the end, you can do a, an exact analog of this construction and effectively decompose the quantum field into its annihilation and creation parts using positive and negative frequencies defined by the time translation symmetry. And if you have space times that are that asymptotically become stationary in the past or the future, you could, you know, define in and out vacua and in and out particle states then in a similar way. But that doesn't cover a lot of the cases that one would be interested in, like cosmology, where you might start with a Big Bang singularity. That's not asymptotically stationary. That's, you know, you're not going to, in any natural way, define some ground state. I mean, especially if the Big Bang singularity doesn't have symmetry, any symmetries associated with it. Uh, and if we want to look at space times describing gravitational collapse to a black hole, again, uh, you know, the asymptotic future includes the inside of the black hole, then we don't have a natural notion of vacuum state or particles. And, you know, well, we don't want to tie the definition of quantum field theory in curved space time to stationarity, because that's way too limiting. Uh, now, you might say, OK, we can't get a preferred vacuum state using stationarity. We don't have this notion of a ground state if we don't have a time translation symmetry. But maybe what we should do is seek some other way you know, of getting a preferred vacuum state. And then once we have a preferred vacuum state, uh, uh, you know, we can then proceed in the same manner as I described in flat space time to formulate quantum field theory in curved space time. This very much reminds me of, you know, students who've studied special relativity and now they're moving on to general relativity. Uh, and, you know, in Special relativity, we formulate things usually using this preferred notion of global inertial coordinates. And then we, you know, you hide the presence of the space time metric in special relativity through the use of these global inertial coordinates. And then you're all, you're just writing down, you know, laws of physics should be invariant under, you know, Lorentz tra Poincaré transformations and stuff like that. Um, and when such students get on to general relativity, the natural thing is, well, well, now let's find the preferred coordinate systems for general relativity. Well, that's a fruitless exercise and a very bad way of thinking about general relativity, much better to realize that the theory is really about a space-time metric and you know you don't need any preferred coordinates i mean for most things you don't need any coordinates at all uh, uh, basically to formulate the ideas so similarly quantum field theory in curved space-time that the game should not be find a preferred vacuum state and a preferred notion of particles, but rather recognize that quantum field theory, one of the few misnomer, non-misnomers in physics, is a very good name for the subject. It's the theory of quantum fields. It's not a theory of particles. Particles are just introduced as a construct. So if you think of what is physical in quantum field theory, it's the local field observables, not particles. It's, of course, nothing wrong with introducing a notion of particles in 
situations where uh, it's useful to do so, just as in general relativity, there's nothing wrong with introducing a nice coordinate system that's adopted to the symmetries of the space time and working in those coordinates, but you shouldn't think of the theory as uh, being fundamentally being formulated in that way. Um, but now if we give up on a choice of a preferred choice of vacuum state, or we can choose any, or we don't have to choose any at all, um, it's not difficult to see that there are zillions, and zillions is an underestimate, of uh, different Hilbert space constructions that you could give for quantum field theory. Uh, you know, again, if we had a preferred vacuum state, then we can give the construction uh, that I described, uh, the analog of the description, this, the construction that I described in Minkowski space time, that will give some preferred Fock representation of the quantum field. Um, but if we're giving up on there being a preferred uh, vacuum state, well, then we have all these unitarily inequivalent choices of Hilbert space constructions. So if we're gonna give up, even if we do all the Hilbert space constructions by choosing a vacuum state and doing a Fox space construction based on that, which we can do, there are zillions of possible vacuum states and that, you know, many of, There's still zillions of, in a, not all uh, various vacuum states will give unitarily inequivalent, unitarily equivalent constructions, but most won't. So there are zillions of then of different constructions. So how do we, if we're gonna give up on this as the first step, how do we formulate quantum field theory in curved space time? Well, there's, a really nice answer to that question, which is use the algebraic approach, which I'm now going to describe. And I should say when people use, you know, the phrase algebraic quantum field theory, I think for most people that brings to mind thick technical math type books on you know, C star algebras and von Neumann algebras and so on. But what I have in mind is an incredibly simple, simple minded, simple uh, 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 ideas and constructions that take no particular mathematical sophistication at all. So the idea is instead of starting with some Hilbert space, of states and then trying to define the field operator on that Hilbert space, we're gonna start with an algebra of observables. So the fundamental observable will be the field operator. As I've already indicated, to do this properly, we have to smear it with a test function. So we have an object of this sort for every possible test function. And now I'm gonna generate, well, a free, the free star algebra associated with this symbol. Well, and I'm gonna include a unit element. So by the free star algebra, I mean just write down any finite sum of finite products of this guy and its star, these are all just symbols. So here's a you know typical element, but you could add 15 more of these guys and you know products up to 98 of these and or you know 1,270 of them or whatever, but it's a finite number of products of Field, smeared field operators and their stars. 
and uh, a finite linear combination of these things. So that's a completely well-defined algebra. I mean, it has a completely well-defined vector space structure and a completely well-defined rule for taking products, right? Again, the identity element is another element of this, so we can add in multiples of the identity if we want to any of these expressions. So this free star algebra is, you know, almost a silly thing to construct, but it's actually just what we want if we impose the relations that this uh, object should satisfy. So there are a couple of trivial relations, one that this object should be linear in F. If I take the sum of two Fs, I get the sum of the phi of F1 plus the phi of F2. So any, when I'm going by, I'm going to impose these relations, by the way, just by saying the two expressions of this sort are considered to be the same if I can manipulate one into the other using any of these, any or all of these relations. So first one is linearity of phi and f. Uh, the second one, because this is supposed to be the real, a real Klein-Gordon scalar field, the star is supposed to just, well, it's supposed to adjoint uh, and the field and complex conjugate the test function, but the adjoint of phi is going to be the same as phi in this case. So this is the reality condition. Um, then I can distributionally impose the Klein-Gordon equation. I want the field to satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation in this way. And finally, uh, this is just the canonical uh, space-time version of the canonical commutation relations for phi, this capital delta is the advanced minus retarded Green's function uh, now smeared in with the f and g that appear here. So the star algebra that describes this Klein-Gordon quantum field is just going to be this free star algebra factored by these relations. So Again, the observables, it should be noted then, you know, are just these correlation functions or linear combinations of these correlation functions. So it's sort of putting the em emphasis on the correlation functions. Well, they're not correlation functions yet, they're correlation algebra elements, uh, but they will become correlation functions when I tell you what states are, and there's just a remarkably simple notion of a state. So now again, I haven't introduced a Hilbert space. I'm avoiding that because I don't have a preferred Hilbert space to uh, try to introduce. But I can nevertheless give the following unbelievably simple definition, well, simple looking, definition of states, namely a state is just a mapping from these algebra elements into complex numbers that satisfies this positivity relation. So this positivity relation is much simpler than it looks because every single algebra element A, had, you know, it's a separate condition for every single algebra element A since it's a nonlinear condition, you can't just check it for a basis or something. You have to check it for all the algebra elements. So this isn't so trivial to check, but that's all that a state is. And the interpretation is that the state as a map in this way is just giving you the expectation value of these sorts of algebra elements. So if we just had this, it's really just giving you the correlation. You know, this thing would be some three-point correlation function. So if I give you, giving you the state is equivalent to giving you 
a list of all of the correlation functions of the quantum field. But of course, I can't give you an arbitrary list of correlation functions that the list has to satisfy this positivity condition. So what does this have to do with states as we know them as vectors in a Hilbert space? Well, remarkably, they're really the same notion, except I'm not sticking to a single Hilbert space in this. If we have a Hilbert space, and on this Hilbert space, we've represented the elements of the algebra by operators, which is the normal thing you do. I mean, if, if you can represent phi as an operator on the Hilbert space, then of course you can represent all of these products as well. Uh, and if you do that, the positivity condition will automatically be satisfied when you take expectation values because the adjoint, we represent the star by an adjoint and this is automatically a positive operator. Uh, so any vector in this Hilbert space is going to give rise to a, an algebraic state in this sense. So that's pretty easy and that's nice, but remarkably it works the other way around too. Any state that I give you in the algebraic sense here, in fact, can be realized as a vector in some Hilbert space representation uh, through the algorithm of take and expectation value. So in fact, I'm not constructing anything really new with this notion of states. I'm just giving you all possible states in all possible Hilbert space representations of the theory. And the proof that it goes the other way, I mean, th this is easy to see, the proof that given a state in this way, you get, you can construct a Hilbert space representation of the theory so that your state is realized as a vector in the Hilbert space is actually incredibly simple and is only, only depends on this star algebra structure. Basically, the algebra, so to get a Hilbert space, you need a vector space, then you need an inner product on the vector space, and it has to be complete, and then we need a representation of A. Well, A itself is a vector space, and if we have a state, we can use this formula to define an inner product, uh, because this is positive, uh, an inner product on the Hilbert space. Well, okay, this is only positive, it's not positive definite, so you may have to factor out by zero norm vectors, and then you'll have to complete the space, but then you get a Hilbert space, and the Hilbert space, because it was made out of the algebra A, has a natural action of A on it. So we get a Hilbert space representation of A, and then if you look at the vector corresponding to the identity element of A, that gives you this relation. So every state uh, in the algebraic sense corresponds to uh, a, a usual Hilbert space state. Um, we haven't done anything new, but now we're free. We specify the algebra first, that's easy. Um, and now we're free to consider all states arising in all Hilbert space constructions without having to make some choice of representation to begin with, which, as I say, is problematic. So we can talk about general, in my analogy before with classical general relativity, we can talk about general relativity as a theory. We don't have to first introduce a coordinate system uh, you know, for the manifold, and then we can start talking about things. We, or we don't even have to make a choice of manifold. We can look at all manifolds. We have the theory. Okay, and that gives a completely, so what I've just described here gives 
a completely satisfactory formulation of quantum field theory of a free Klein-Gordon field. But we want to go beyond that, and it really is important that we've formulated things in the algebraic approach to enable us to go on that, because if, if we had to first choose some Hilbert space representation, then our constructions might only work for that representation, etc. It would be very hard to uh, make further progress. So we want to go beyond what I described in at least two ways. First of all, if we, even if we were only interested in the theory of a clean, free Klein-Gordon field, there are lots of non-linear observables of interest like the stress energy tensor which is classical classically is quadratic in the field that's not represented in our algebra we only have correlation functions of the linear field in the algebra um, but furthermore we might want to do interacting quantum fields in curved space time uh, well, we don't know how to do interacting fields really in flat space time either, but we do know how to do perturbative interacting quantum fields. So we'd like to do at least that much in curved space time, but that will require us to be able to define time ordered products of, I mean, the perturbative formulas will involve time ordered products of powers you know wick polynomials of the free field so the way to go about this would then be to enlarge this original algebra that i described here enlarge that so that it would include all wick polynomials and all time ordered products of these wick polynomials and if we can do that then we've got the this covered and we've got perturbative quantum field theory and curved space time co covered so how do we go about defining something like phi squared um the basic problem is that phi of x as i've already described is not defined so if you try to I mean, even in flat space time, or you know, if you try to just square it, it, you get a nonsense formula. I mean, if you write down some formula for phi of x and try to define the square, uh, you know, and it doesn't help to try to define phi squared smeared with some f in this way because when you let this become a delta function which should give you the you know the phi squared you get you know a divergent expression so you need to do some sort of subtraction of the infinity that you're going to get as you let the fn approach a delta function i mean this right hand side for a finite fn is perfectly well uh Define, you know, for a smooth function fn, this is just some sort of smearing of, you know, the product of the two fields smearing in each variable, but letting fn approach a delta function is problematical. So suppose that we are just trying to define the expected value of phi squared in some state. I want to define phi squared as an algebra element, but um, well, there are lots of states where have with that have sort of worse ultraviolet behavior than the Minkowski space than the vacuum state in Minkowski space time. And one wouldn't expect you'd be able to define phi squared for that. But if we look at Hadamard states, Hadamard states are ones for which the two-point correlation function has singular behavior like that of the, of the vacuum in Minkowski space-time. But if we're in a curved space-time, we need to allow some 
function of x and y in the numerator here rather than one. And we need to allow a logarithmic term here, but we can construct solutions to the wave equation in x and y of this form in a curved space time. Uh, so if we restrict to Hadamard states, um, we can define uh, the expected value of the square by subtracting off this singular behavior. So if phi of x, phi of y is of the Hadamard form, when we do this subtraction with some locally constructed Hadamard parametrics, uh, then we're guaranteed to get something non-singular and I can let y approach x uh, with no uh, problem now. So that's gonna uh, work and that will give a unique definition up to some local curvature terms. I mean, we have choice of what we're gonna choose for this locally constructed Hadamard parametrics that gives rise to that, but that gives uh, a satisfactory description. Of course, if we don't have a Hadamard state, then we don't define this, but it's really too singular is the view to for it to exist. We don't want to define phi squared. Okay, but we want to define this as an operator, not just define expectation values in some states. So we'd really like to include this as an algebra element. Uh, so how do we go about doing that? That's quite another step. Well, to carry out this step, uh, the first thing is that this Hadamard condition is actually, well, is quite cumbersome to work with. Uh, so it's extremely useful to switch to an equivalent characterization of this uh, uh, distribution here that we have on the right-hand side. And an equivalent, the, well, an equivalent characterization was given well, by now nearly 30 years ago by Radzikowski in terms of the wave front set properties of this distribution. So I'm not going to sidetrack into the definition of the wave front set, what the wave front set is, but the idea is that if you take Fourier transforms and look at the behavior of of the, the Fourier transform distribution at large k, so you pick a direction in Fourier space, k, which I'm calling k, and you go off to infinity, the failure of that distribution to decay rapidly in k space is a sign of singular or at least non-smooth behavior of the distribution uh, in position space. So you can characterize, this is all I want to communicate, the, 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 the wave front set describes the points and directions in K space at which you don't have this rapid fall off and it thereby characterizes in a quite refined way the singular behavior of this distribution. So if I tell you the wavefront set, I'm kind of characterizing the points and the directions in which this distribution is singular. The wavefront set for a Hadamard type distribution, well, is given by this. It's, it includes only null geodesics. We have two points, so we have two Ks involved. And 
Uh, it's singular only when points x1 and x2 are connected by a null geodesic and uh, that and the null, well, these null vectors are tangent to that null geodesic, well, with one of them being minus the other in direction. So back 25 years ago or so, uh, Brunetti, Fred, and Hagen, and Kohler realized that with this reformulated definition one could get an enlarged algebra of observables, and I'll describe that briefly. So if we choose a Hadamard state, well, we don't want to choose a Hadamard state. You know, that's like getting a preferred vacuum. So this, we're going to have to get rid of this in the end, but in in order to define the enlarged algebra, we can start uh, by introducing a preferred uh, Hadamard state, and we can define a normal ordered version of this endpoint product that appears in our algebra A that we're already starting with, where we subtract off the vacuum expectation value of phi of x, phi of y, and products of them by the same formula that would be used to define normal ordered normal ordering with respect to the vacuum state in flat space time. So in particular, we define the normal ordered product of phi one phi of x1, phi of x2 by its product minus the identity times the vacuum expectation value of phi of x, phi of y. So this, we can switch to these normal ordered products as basically a change of basis of A, uh, right? There's no, we're not doing anything except introducing this new notation and using these guys rather than these guys to describe the A elements. But then the commutation relations are encoded, uh, you know, for products of these guys. Uh, well, that can be written in terms of these, these type guys, but terms with a lot of products of these vacuum expectation values. But if this is Hadamard, then once you have that formula, you can see that the product formula continues to make sense when you smear this not just with nice test functions in X1 through Xn, but you can smear it with a big class of distributions, including a smooth function times a delta function. But a smooth function times a delta function would give you something that you should interpret as this. So you can enlarge the algebra uh, in the way that I, in this way that I've just explained, although the construction depends on choosing a particular algebra, uh, a particular Hadamard state to do these constructions. However, the algebra as an abstract algebra does not depend on the choice of omega naught. So uh, we actually then end up with an extended algebra of observables that is big enough to contain, well, it should be big enough to contain the fields we want and big enough to contain product time ordered products of these fields. Um, but we have to figure out still how to define these fields because this thing, as I've written here, is an imposter for the nth power of the field. This does not give choosing a state, well, you'd have to choose a different state in every space time, you know, because you don't have 
one state for different space times. Uh, and that will just, that will give something that is not locally and covariantly defined. Uh, we want a definition of phi n that depends on the metric in a local and covariant way. But if you proceed and look for such a thing, then it's possible to show that indeed you can find objects that are kind of made out of, that are like these guys, but now they're defined locally and covariantly. Basically, instead of subtracting off the ex expected value in uh, some vacuum state or some chosen state omega naught, we subtract off some locally constructed Hadamard parametrics. If you do that, that will define a phi n that depends on the metric in a local and covariant way. And you can show that the prescription you get is unique up to certain local curvature ambiguities. Um, it's a lot more complicated to analyze time ordered products that way. And I'm not going to go through that. I'm near the end of my time anyway. But again, you can, you've got the algebra. The algebra is big enough to contain time ordered products. So you just have to find the elements in there that you can legitimately call time ordered products. And they do exist. Uh, namely, there exist elements of the algebra that are local and covariant and satisfy what's actually in this case, a rather long list of additional properties that time ordered products should satisfy. And the prescription is again, unique up to the what you would naively expect as renormalization ambiguities. I mean, you have ambiguities in the definition of the wick powers themselves, like I've indicated here, and you have additional, you know, contact terms that arise for the time ordered products, but they're just like the ones that you get in Minkowski space time uh, with additional local curvature ambiguities. Okay, so that is what the situation is in quantum field theory in curved space time. And in summary, the theory of a free quantum field theory in curved space time can be given, as I've written here, in a completely mathematically rigorous formulation, uh, uh, you know, by just writing down what the algebra of observables uh, is what writing down, uh, you know, using the algebraic notion of a state. Uh, and over the last 25 years, we've learned how to extend that algebra to include the nonlinear field observables. Those are not unique, but they have well-specified local curvature ambiguities. And we can do perturbative quantum field, th interacting quantum field theory in curved space time, as well as in Minkowski space time. Uh, again, there are additional local curvature ambiguities in the renormalization that you wouldn't encounter in Minkowski space time. But as a matter of principle, it's still the same. I mean, it's it's not it's not worse uh, other than having you know more counter terms as uh, the terminology goes of course it would be nice to define interacting quantum field theory in curved space time in a non perturbative way i'll just comment that i mean a number well ideas have been explored i mean particularly by stefan hollands in and work on this is ongoing of uh, um, using the operator product expansions that I have not talked about here, but there are 
for interacting quantum fields, well, perturbatively for interacting quantum fields, there are, I'm just looking for the right thing to point to, uh, short distance uh, singular behavior in the products of fields that is analogous to what I've written here. Here we'd have an identity operator coming in if I got rid of these, uh, well, I'd have the identity operator coming in as, as to how this uh, uh, behaves. I mean, but more generally, there'd be all sorts of other expected fields coming in uh, in the short distance uh, expansion. And some ideas of using this to try to give a non-perturbative formulation of quantum field theory in curved space time is something being explored, but it, you know, is in a uh, early stage uh, uh, right now. Okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, we have some time for questions, so please uh, raise your hands or type them in the chat. Okay, Stephen, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> trying to get all, everything turned off. Hi, Steve, by the way. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Uh, it's hard enough to make rigorous sense out of in interacting field theories in flat. So the, the last sentence of your talk, referring to work by Stefan Hollins, is that something that adapts uh, the work of, say, Glim and Jaffe uh, to curve no, space time? No, no, totally it, it's a completely different idea. And again, it's, you know, well, he's been working on it a while, but it's still, uh, you know, overall in an early stage. So th this is a completely different approach whereby you try to define flow relations for the uh, parameters, well, flow relations for the operator product expansions in terms of how they flow with the coupling constants of the theory. And those, uh, well, provide some, I mean, you've got all the, the, the infinite list of operator product expansion coefficients coming in. Uh, they, what he proved is that order by order in perturbation theory, they satisfy flow relations. Let's see, there's some uh, background noise that may be a little, but anyway, let me continue on, that satisfy flow relations relative to the coupling parameters. So that effectively gives some infinite system of ordinary differential equations, you know, D operator product expansion coefficient D parameter equals, if you could solve those, which, you know, is a colossal if, uh, you know, then since you know the operator product expansion coefficients when the nonlinear coupling constants are zero, so you have a free field, you could in principle determine the operator product expansion relations for the interacting field. And that, well, we've previously argued that that would give you essentially all the information about the, the interacting field. It's very hard to imagine proceeding, you know, in a kind of, you know, glim Jaffe way that really heavily re relies on a Euclideanization of the theory. Uh, 
you know, to make sense of, you know, functional integrals and so on, because in, in curved space time, again, without, unless you're in a static space time, uh, you know, there isn't some natural Euclideanization of the theory or something. So that was a long answer to just, I mean, I had a concluding sentence in my slides that I talked about, but, you know, there are some ideas on the table, but uh, um, you know, again, they're not—they're far from highly developed. We have some questions in the chat. Ekim is asking for some references, recent reviews, books that you like to recommend on the topic. Yeah, there, there's a uh, review article published in Physics Reports, I mean, posted on the archive. It's probably from about five years ago by Stefan Hollins and me that my lecture notebook only deals with the free quantum fields, all the developments of the last, you know, the book is 30 years old or 28 years old or so, uh, you know, these developments that I talked about at the end of the talk really began uh, about 25 years ago or so. Um, so they're not included in the lecture notebook, but this review includes every, certainly everything that I talked about. So again, it's Hollins and me. Uh, physics reports and on the archives probably about five years ago or so uh as best as i can remember we have another question by bruno um, people physically motivate the introduction of quantum fields by using particles on a Weinberg. what suggests that our theory should be about fields if we discard the this particle argument? Um, I don't, you know, again, one could say in special relativity, we don't need any of this metric nonsense. We can just work with global inertial coordinates and write everything down. But that's not a good way to deal with what you have to deal with when you get into general relativity. And again, you can use particles in flat space time and in stationary curved space times, uh, you know, to great effect, but it, uh, you know, it's just not a very good way of, or not a good way at all in my, in my view of approaching quantum field theory in curved space time. And I think the Unruh effect is probably, uh, you know, which, occurs in flat space time as well as a very good example of that. It gets, you know, the accelerating observer is in a thermal bath of particles. That gets awfully confusing if you're trying to ascribe reality to the particles, as opposed to it's a convenient way of describing what's happening with the fields uh, and what the fields are doing to your detector and so on. But how do you, how do you, I mean, how would you explain, uh, well, I, Weinberg, I, I, well, I'm not sure the reference to Weil, but how do you explain, if you want to say everything is about particles, how do you explain the Unruh effect to somebody? Okay, and for the last question, um, um, can we gain any new physical insight from this well-formulated quantum theory and curved space-time state algebraic formulation? Can this help to solve black hole information loss paradox, shed new light into our understanding of space-time singularities? Okay, so on um, the understanding of space-time singularities, no, I don't see that this helps anything at all. and. And for that, you clearly need quantum gravity. So it's not, not only is the algebraic approach not helpful, but probably quantum, well, quantum field theory and curved space time might be helpful in that it 
might give you some hint of behavior that's occurring in the matter fields near the singularity. Um, uh, but I mean, as far as, you know, the information issue is concerned, I mean, it, well, as far as I'm concerned, it makes, it makes me, uh, you know, a lot more comfortable with the idea of information loss. I mean, I've never been that uncomfortable about it, but it, you know, you've got uh, a perfectly good state at late times. Uh, I mean, if there is information loss, if you want to look at the algebra of observable of late time observables, the state that you have there, if there is information loss, is mixed. But you know, if you restrict to any proper subalgebra of observables, the state on that subset of algebras will be uh, that subset of the algebra will be mixed in general. So, you know, there's nothing if you're not trying to stick all the states in one Hilbert space and you just think about you've got an algebra of observables and you've got a state on it in the sense, I mean, what's the problem with there being with your state having the property that relative to the sub algebra of late time observables, it's mixed. I don't see any problem at all. So I think it helps in that way in terms of making one much more comfortable with or more comfortable with information loss if you know if you're not kind of it has to be a state a vector in this one Hilbert space that I chose at the beginning and I'm not going to allow you to ever think of anything else. <laughs>